My name's Dermot Turing. I'm Alan Turing's nephew. The Enigma machine was a very interesting invention. During the World War I era, uh, the military forces on, on all sides of the conflict had uh, uh, discovered the use of radio as very helpful in terms of uh, commanding large units and uh, organising huge armies across very large battlefields. And so the importance of having codes and ciphers to disguise what they were, the orders they were giving was, became very important. And so immediately after World War I, people started thinking about new and more secure ways of creating codes and ciphers. And this brilliant German inventor called uh, Scherbius uh, came up with the idea of a machine that uh, would change the cipher every single time you pressed a letter. So you'd press an A, and then the first time you press it, you might get a K. The second time you press A, you might get a Q. You know, it changed all the time. In an Enigma machine, you've got three rotors. So you've got a choice about which rotors you put in which positions. If you've got three rotors, you've got six different ways of setting that up. And the Germans have five rotors to choose from. So if you choose any three out of the five, then there are 60 different ways that you can put rotors in the machine. That's a secret, which three they're using and which positions they're in. Then there's a problem about which way rounds the rotors are. They can each be put in 26 positions, one for each letter of the alphabet. So there's 26 times 26 times 26 different setups just for the positioning of the three rotors. That's 17,000 odd numbers. So there's quite a lot of possibilities there. But then there's the real horror, which is the plug board on the front of the machine. That connects one letter to another, so you can put the plug in at Q and you can connect it to J or K or L or whatever. They were using 10 cables on the plug board and the number of different possibilities for setting up the plug board with 10 different cables is an astronomical number. The Germans were so impressed with their Enigma machine that they believed it had almost superhuman degree of security. And that meant that they depended on it massively and the number of Enigma enciphered messages that they sent out skyrocketed when France and Britain found themselves at war in 1940. They were all taken by surprise a bit by the vast number of uh, Enigma messages that were being sent every day on dozens of different networks that the Germans were using. They used it for the army, uh, they used it for all sorts of other things including railways and dockyards and all sorts of other things which may not be of immediate strategic value but were very helpful to the code breakers. For Poland as a nation it was absolutely critical to figure out how this machine worked, what its wiring was, and what the settings that the Germans were using every day to uh, encipher their messages were. After Poland managed to reclaim its independence at the end of World War I, and then had to fight a life and death war with the Soviet Union, Marshal Pilsudski realized that his victory over the Soviet Union was largely attributable to good quality code breaking and signals intelligence. And so he fostered the growth and development of a quite small code breaking team in Poland when other countries were disbanding their code breaking and military intelligence facility. The decision was taken very early on, at the end of the 1920s, to hire some mathematicians to help specifically with the Enigma machine cipher problem. And this culminates in uh, 1932 when Marian Rievsky is set to work on the Enigma problem. And very rapidly, the Polish code-breaking unit is able, with the astonishing work of Marian Rievsky to figure out what the wiring was on the German military version of the Enigma machine, this secret data that nobody knew. And then together with his colleagues Jerzy Rzycki and Henryk Zygalski, the three of them could work on this difficult question about which of the 150 million, million, million possible settings the Germans were using every day 
You can't go through them systematically and try one by one because you'd be here until the uh, universe comes to an end before you ever got a result. So that's, that's just not, not a feasible way of doing it. Marion Rievsky had spotted that there were certain sequences in the preamble of German messages that had a pattern in it, and particularly they had repeated letters in, in the patterns. And if you looked at the pattern of those repeated letters, you could find that what he called cycles would manifest themselves. So that one letter, uh, let's say you could have an A that was transforming into a J, and then in another message a J would transform into a P, and then in another message a P would transform into a C, and then in another message a C would transform into an A, which is where you started. And so you built up like a cycle of these things. And the length of the cycle, so whether there were four or five letters in a cycle, or 12 letters in a cycle or only three letters in a cycle, that's a characteristic of the choice of the three rotors that you have got in the Enigma machine. And so what they did was they were exploiting this characteristic of the rotors that were being chosen to eliminate impossible rotor combinations just by looking at these preamble sequences of the German messages. They've developed machines to help them in that process. So they invented this cyclometer machine, the thing that's been rebuilt at Cambridge University, it's very exciting, and what it would do is help you eliminate impossible rotor combinations just by speeding up the process of analysing cycle lengths. And they've invented this thing called the Bomber, which is a fully automated machine able to it does exactly the same thing. It exploits the repeated uh, letters found in the preamble to German messages. But then what it does is it will test automatically for not just a rotor combination, but a rotor setup so that which way the rotors are configured at the beginning of encipherment. Uh, and it will stop when it tells you that it thinks it's found the correct starting point for all these messages. You can see that we've got a sort of, we've moved from essentially pencil and paper techniques to a semi-automated device, which is the cyclometer, to a fully automatic thing. You can switch it on and then go to lunch. And then when, it can, when you come back from lunch, it may have stopped and tell you what it thinks that the, the rotor positions are. So you can see this sort of evolution. And then just to complete the story, you then end up with this device designed by Alan Turing and Gordon Welshman at Bletchley Park, which no longer requires this six-letter repeated sequence to carry out its logic test. So when the Germans changed that system in 1940, that meant that cyclometers and the Polish bomber were no longer uh, going to be useful against Enigma, but the, bomb, the new bomb machine was able to take over where those machines had left off. Poland had made the first steps to try and understand the Enigma problem. And that work is happening even before Adolf Hitler comes to power. So they're really ahead of the game. You then go to 1939. By that stage, the French have come into the picture and they have figured out that this Enigma problem can't be solved by a, any single country on its own. And so what they try to do is to get the British and the Polish codebreakers all together with themselves into a room and share their knowledge on Enigma. The Polish military authorities realised that the secret they had about codebreaking of Enigma was an extremely dangerous one and it was an extremely valuable one. But if anybody else finds out, the danger is that the Germans will change the system and lock everybody out of this priceless source of information. So quite sensibly, the Polish authorities were not going to share their knowledge with anybody else. There were two important meetings. One was at the beginning of January 1939. And at that stage, the Polish authorities had not authorised the Polish codebreakers to say anything about what they had discovered. So everybody smiled very sweetly and they had a nice dinner, but there was really not any substantive sharing of information at, uh, at that meeting. But by the time you get to the summer of 1939, 
the German threat to Poland has just become huge and it becomes very important from the Polish military perspective to get the French in particular to commit to a military response if Germany invades Poland. And they need to pay for that. So what are they what currency does Poland have to pay for a French and British military commitment? And the thing that they could trade was the Enigma secret. So they called another meeting, which took place just outside Warsaw in July of 1939, and the most astonishing thing happened. There were, over two days, every single thing, every single thing that the Polish codebreakers knew about Enigma and their techniques for finding the Enigma key every day were disclosed. So the French and importantly the British were able to go back to their home countries and say we now have the answers to all the questions we had about the Enigma machine and what's more we've had insights into ideas for finding the settings that we had never even conceived of in, in our studies on the thing. Alan Turing was a mathematics student at uh, King's College Cambridge and uh, I think what he was famous for in his lifetime was uh, some theoretical work that he did uh, when he was actually a graduate student there. Um, there was an unsolved question in the theory of mathematics at the time, um, which was something to do with the provability of theorems, and nothing to do with code breaking. But he had um, come up with this concept of a mechanical process, a machine, which these days we would call a Turing machine. And the function of this machine would change according to the, uh, what these days the, we would call a program that you fed to the machine to, to change its behavior. What he rapidly realized that he had done was come up with a blueprint for a programmable multi-purpose uh, computing machine. After uh, Alan Turing graduated he spent two years um, studying at Princeton University in the United States and when he came back in 1938 he realized that uh, Britain was just about on the verge of war. At exactly that time, the head of MI6 told Alistair Denniston, who was the head of an organisation called the Government Code and Cipher School, which was just a cover name for what was essentially Britain's code-breaking uh, facility. He told Denniston to build up a list of what were called men of the professor type, who could join the Government Code and Cipher School in the event that war really did break out. And so Denniston went round the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge, uh, and in particular they were interested in King's College Cambridge because it had so many code breakers from the World War I era who were still at the college. And so they went and talked to loads of people at King's College Cambridge and Alan Turing was one of them. Alan Turing was invited to go on a code-breaking course, you know, to find out the elements of codes and ciphers, uh, and was put on the reserve list. And so when war was declared uh, immediately after Poland was invaded, then uh, the people on the reserve list, these men of the professor type, were all called in by that stage, the Government Code and Cipher School had moved to its so-called war station, which was a place we now call Bletchley Park. So Alan Turing turned up at Bletchley Park and he arrived on the 4th of September 1939. He's moved from thinking about machines in a very theoretical kind of way for solving a, an, an unsolved philosophical question in mathematics to a much more practical thing, which, which is designing the guts of a machine that is going to break the enigma. Once the people at Bletchley had got the vital information from the Polish code breakers about how the enigma machine was wired and the ideas that the Polish code breakers had uh, passed on about 
how to figure out the problem of how the Germans had set up their machine every day. They were able to build this machine which was called the bomb. What the bomb machine was able to do was to cut down hugely the number of different Enigma setups that needed to be tested to see if you got the right one. And the way it did it was you take what was called a probable word. You look for what you think the Germans might be saying to each other. There's a story about uh, a German Enigma operator in North Africa later in the war who um, was in a very quiet part of the desert and he sent a report every morning saying nothing to report. Well that was great so if you know that this guy is saying nothing to report every day it's not a very interesting message but it's very helpful because it's the same thing every day so you, you can test nothing to report against whatever we found. Did Q turn into N? Did J turn into O and so forth. You can test that. So you set up a machine to test every single letter to see if it transformed in the way that you observed. And if you can find a rotor position that matches for all the places in the, in the message that were enciphered as they were, then you might have found the way that the Germans had set up their machine that day. So that was the principle behind the British machine. The British called it a bomb and the reason they called it a bomb was because there was a predecessor machine that the Poles had invented called a bomba and they wanted to pay tribute to the Polish inventors of the bomba machine which had inspired them with the idea to create this new very sophisticated bomb machine um, that was used at Bletchley Park. Uh, eventually they ended up making building hundreds of these bomb machines uh, not just at Bletchley Park, but they had two large um, facilities in London which were full of bomb machines just to crank out the possible Enigma settings on loads of different networks right the way across the German military empire. When Poland was invaded by Germany and then by the Soviet Union uh, in uh, September of 1939, the Polish codebreakers were essentially ordered to flee the country because what they knew was such, uh, uh, such vital information. They reassembled the code-breaking team under the control of the French uh, just outside Paris in the um, late autumn of uh, 1939. Uh, and then they started cooperating again, not just with the French but also with the British. And that did actually establish a relationship between Bletchley Park and the Polish codebreakers um, because the old three country alliance was still in, in operation at that time. But then, as we know, France fell to the Germans in the spring of 1940 and the Polish codebreakers had to escape again. They went to French North Africa uh, and uh, then, after a few weeks there, they were secretly reintroduced into the unoccupied part of France and the French rehired the Polish codebreakers to form the centerpiece of this codebreaking unit in the south of France. Amongst other things, they were working on breaking German Enigma messages in deepest secrecy, even though their sponsoring French government was supposed to be uh, under an agreement with the Germans that they wouldn't do that. Uh, that carried on, as I say, until uh, the occupation of France in 1942. Marin Riefsky and Henrik Zagalski managed to escape eventually to uh, the UK and they reported to their superior officers in the uh, Polish military here in London and were set to work doing some code breaking, which they did not at Bletchley Park, but they were doing it in a Polish facility, which nobody's ever heard of, halfway between London and Bletchley Park, which is coincidental, but uh, interesting. They weren't really doing much Enigma work by that stage. Marian Rejewski in particular wrote, I am not really making a proper contribution uh, on Enigma anymore. I know that the British are doing something, I don't know what it is, and it would make a lot of sense if we could re-establish that atmosphere of sharing that we had at the beginning of the war because uh, there's obviously something I can contribute. It doesn't appear that his 
memorandum ever reached Bletchley Park, I think it probably got lost at MI6 somewhere. Like many people in Britain, I had vaguely heard that there was a Polish attack on the Enigma problem before Alan Turing got involved with it at Bletchley Park. The achievements of Bletchley Park were kept as a massive secret. Talking about what happened at Bletchley Park was still illegal until well into the 1970s. And so nobody wrote about it, nobody talked about it, and the people who had worked at Bletchley Park were under an oath of silence, so they were not able to. In the mid-1970s, the UK government permitted some limited disclosure of what had happened at Bletchley Park to uh, be made public. And that started this explosion of interest, like sort of the big, amazing, untold story of World War II, and it captured the British imagination, and it was all about Bletchley Park, and then it became all about the bomb, and all about Alan Turing, and all about Enigma, and I think there really wasn't much space in that, what had become a British national narrative, for talking about, well, how did that come to be <laughs> and so the Polish the Polish piece was just sort of then there, ne there never was space to talk about it the way I see it is that if you don't tell the Polish part of the story it's not just that you're missing out on some of the fun and exciting and interesting parts of the story about Enigma but you're probably forgetting that World War II was all about alliances and it was all about international cooperation and I think the Enigma story is just a microcosm of that international cooperation, but it's an important one. Certainly the reconstruction of the cyclometer machine is very interesting. It's a lovely project in its own right. It helps reinforce the message that Bletchley Park didn't just come out of nowhere and uh, uh, that it had this big debt to pay to the Polish co-breakers. There's another way of looking at it as well, though, which is I think that it's about the importance of technology, it's about the theory behind the, the uh, breaking of Enigma, and I think that's not something that's stuck in the 1930s. This is something that's uh, very valuable as a piece of mathematical uh, analysis and, and thinking for students today, and you know, to think about, I mean, it's about permutation theory, and that's just as, uh, you know, modern uh, concept as it was in the 1930s. So, you know, I I'm, I'm applaud the work that they've done to bring this thing to life because it gives us an opportunity to talk about all sorts of things. Yes, it gives us a chance to talk about Enigma and Bletchley Park and the Polish contribution, but it also gives us a chance to talk about mathematics and permutation theory as well, so it's great.